Hello, my name is Austin Habish, the founder of Think Catholic, your source for Catholic thought with both depth and devotion, and I'd like to thank you for joining us. Joining me is Dr. Alan Fimister. Hello. And Dr. Tom McLaughlin. Hello. As well as special guest Dr. John Brungart, as we today discuss the principle of least action, particularly as it bears on teleology or finality, the goal-directedness in things. But first, the Catholic thought on the topic. And the Catholic thought, as it bears on the reality of finality or teleology in things, comes to us from the encyclical Humani Generis, which states, quote, Philosophy, acknowledged and accepted by the Church, safeguards the genuine validity of human knowledge, the unshakable metaphysical principles of sufficient reason, causality and finality, and finally, the mind's ability to attain certain and unchangeable truth, end quote. And as a published expert and speaker on the principle of least action in physics, along with its teleological implications, Dr. Tom McLaughlin, would you like to introduce our guest? Uh, yes, I would. Um, Dr. John Brungart is an assistant professor of philosophy at the School of Catholic Studies at Newman University. As a philosopher, Catholic layman, and Dominican tertiary, his studies, teaching, and scholarship aim at continuing the philosophical tradition of St. Thomas Aquinas, Aristotle, and their heirs. Uh, Dr. John Brungart attempts to bring their insights into meaningful dialogue with modern theories, especially modern scientific theories. His central interests lie in the philosophy of nature and in the philosophy of science. Uh, Dr. John Brungar, maybe you could begin by explaining to us just very briefly why the principle of least action is especially of interest to those in the scientific community. Sure. And first, I'd like to just thank you, Austin, for having me on. It's a good opportunity. Yeah, um, it's a pleasure. Uh, see, I want to start with just a, um, a basic description of what this is, uh, and then some of the uh, enthusiasm or lack thereof among scientists for this principle. Mm. Um, so the, the principle of least action, uh, you can think of it as when a, an, a body, like a rock uh, or even water, it could be a liquid, when, it, when it's moving naturally, uh, it takes a motion path that minimizes a quantity that physicists call action. Um, and technically action is measured in uh, joules times seconds, but we don't have to worry about that right off. Um, but the, the basic point is that the principle points out that a natural motion minimizes this quantity compared to other possible, conceivably other possible quantities that could have. So it, it looks like it, uh, that nature's uh, economizing. It looks like nature's being very efficient. Um, uh, w one philosopher put it that, uh, that action is a kind of partnership between time and energy. Uh, so you, you economize on energy through time. And there's, uh, so that's the basic idea. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the signs that it's a very important physical principle, um, well, I'm going to categorize them into two types. There's the first kind of sign that it's very important is uh, physicists get not quite emotional, but they do get very uh, effusive in their uh, praise or worries about this physical principle. Um, and then however they react to it or however their own uh, philosophical take on it falls out, uh, they use it everywhere. <laughs> so I think those are two signs of its importance. So I just wanted to share some quotes, if I could, on that, that first point. Okay, so the French mathematician who... Uh, initially hit upon this principle, uh, Maupertuis, uh, he considered it the principle that God used in the very construction of the universe. Uh, Leibniz, so the, the German philosopher and really polymath Leibniz, uh, also considered it uh, a purely architectonic principle. 
Uh, so there's the, the sense that uh, because we see nature uh, economizing, because we see nature uh, among alternate poss apparent alternate possibilities picking the most efficient path, uh, that there's a, a kind of order there. There's a kind of best outcome there. Uh, so then on the flip side, you get scientists reacting to it a bit more strongly who, uh, well, if you prefer, no, nature's just full of forces and particles and you can measure and predict them and that's it. Uh, so the French physicist uh, Henri Poincaré said, the very enunciation of the principle of least action is objectionable. The body seems to know the point to which we want to take it, to foresee the time it will take to reach it by such a path, and then to know how to choose the most convenient path. He sees, it, so Poincaré sees in it a kind of return to a, a, an appeal to final causality in nature that usually we might not think, oh, that's present or implied by the mathematics of a physical system. This next gentleman, Moritz Schlick, he's more of a, uh, a philosopher, um, but he points out that it should be borne in mind above all when examining the difference in the legitimacy of causal and uh, finalistic or teleological viewpoints that the, the, this principle is really just mathematical. So the claim is there, that, well, you could interpret it that way but you're really adding to the mathematics. You're, you're bringing in principles outside of mathematical physics. So those are some of the reactions I've encountered to the principle when the scientists or philosophers speak about it. Um, but at the same time, when, when the physicists are doing their work, they use it all over. Uh, so it's, it's at least one way to formulate all the basic principles in classical mechanics um, an analogous version of it is also used in general relativity. So that's uh, Einstein's uh, theory of gravity. Um, and a, a different analogous version of it is used in quantum mechanics. And that was discovered by Richard Feynman. So if you think about that, there you have, um, kind of, and this is uh, more of a comic book version of the comparisons between these theories, but if, I mean, you have classical mechanics, which takes care of most of the things that we encounter day to day. You have quantum mechanics, which is uh, the theory of the very, very small. And then you have general relativity, so the theory of how physical systems interact on the scale of the entire universe. So that's kind of by induction, that seems like that's a very universal principle. Um, yes, yeah, so that's, that's it for that question then. Thank you. Um, John, would you say a little bit about how the principle of least action has, as it were, survived the major scientific revolutions? So it's formulated long before quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. but nevertheless had worked in quantum mechanics. It's formulated kind of in a context of Newtonian physics, but yet it works in general relativity. Mm -hmm. um, could you say a little bit about that? So in my... In my own work as in as a philosopher of science, as I'm trying to learn all this, I, I do have a uh, I resort to what I call um, uh, listening. <laughs> so what the scientists tell me. Like, so here's here's what they've told me uh, in answer to that question. It's, so the the principle of least action. The the main reason it it can survive those sorts of um, Breakthroughs, so yeah, so from Newtonian physics to quantum physics or Newtonian gravity to uh, general relativity is that uh, any of those theories, they still use um, energy as a basic unit. Um, so since they still use energy as a basic unit, and I'm, I was hoping to get into this later on uh, so we can come back to it in more detail, but uh, since they still use energy as a basic way to measure the physical properties of the, the system that they're considering, um, and especially potential energy and kinetic energy, uh, you essentially, in each of those theories, you just come up with uh, a formula that expresses, uh, okay, what is the relevant way to express 
potential and kinetic energy uh, in this situation or that situation. And so it's going to look different in those different domains. Uh, the mathematical formula looks different. Um, but the, the reason that it survives across those domains is that there's still this uh, 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 fundamental currency, as it were, of energy. You just need to express it appropriately depending on what you're studying. Um, and so for those who don't have a bachelor's, let's say a master's in physics, um, what are maybe some helpful analogies on how the principle of least action, action excuse me, works out in day-to-day -day motion or change uh, that would be easy uh, to grasp and would be instances of this principle playing out kind of in our daily lives? Yeah, so uh, here I'm going to be kind of unoriginal. Um, I'm going to use one of Richard Feynman's analogies. Uh, and one way to think about it before, well, but yeah, so before we get going there, one way to think about it is uh, the principle of least action is, is a kind of optimization question. So if you've, you know, if you've ever encountered a, a problem in, you know, even high school math, it's like, okay, so you have, you have uh, 20 yards of, of fencing available and you want to, you want to build a, a four-sided rectangular enclosure that has the most area it's like what are the dimensions so, so there you're optimizing um, in that case you're optimizing area uh, but you also have a constraint like you only have so much fence and so for the the principle of least action that the constraint is usually time it's like you want to get from here to there in a certain time so Feynman gives this great analogy of a lifeguard so you have to imagine okay a lifeguard is walking along the beach uh, We'll imagine it's California, so the ocean's on your right, you're walking south. And then you, you see someone struggling out there in the Pacific surf, uh, not directly to your right, but over towards your right, so kind of diagonally away from you. Okay, so now you gotta go save them. Um, and you wanna get there in the least amount of time. Uh, but then you think, okay, but running on sand is, uh, I can go at one pace when I'm running on sand. And then if I have to swim through water, well, that's going to be slower compared to even running on sand. Uh, so then he, uh, Feynman kind of maps out different possibilities. Well, the if the lifeguard takes too little sand, then he'll have to swim through more water. If he takes too much sand, that will actually take more time, even if he cuts down on the, the amount of water he has to swim through. So there's a trade-off. And so you compared to going through over sand and through water, uh, the, the most efficient path is actually the one that's in between uh, the one that has the least amount of s sand versus the one that has the least, uh, the least amount of water, say. I think, I think another analogy uh, might help, and it's a bit closer to the actual physical principle. Um, and again, I'm borrowing this from, uh, from someone else that, you could you could imagine that you're a uh, you're a farmer and you're digging a well and you have, you want water to get from your well to your crops across the way in, on your in your property but your property's hilly and it's it's rocky enough that you can't just dig a pipe right through the hills um, and so you want to economize on the amount of time per day that you take uh, pumping water to your crops. Uh, so if you built the pipes, perhaps in a, a very direct route, uh, it might actually take you more time to pump the amount of water that you needed for that day. Whereas, whereas if you took a more indirect route that kind of hugged the, the terrain a bit more, even if it's by length more inefficient, that's not what you're trying to optimize. The, the, you're trying to shorten the amount of time and the amount of energy you expend pumping the amount of water you need per day. So you'd, you'd pick that sort of path. In, in physics, uh, this can come out, I think the easiest examples that are actual, uh, within actual uh, physics, and here you, we're, we can start to drop uh, analogies, is, uh, well, if you, uh, if you have little or no forces, say, acting on uh, it could be a satellite in deep space. 
so it's it's far enough into deep space that uh, uh, you can, for all intents and purposes, you can neglect gravity. Uh, then what you can derive, what you can show on the assumption that uh, a physical system will minimize uh, its its energy expenditure through time, essentially, you can show that it's going to take uh, a straight path. Now that that might not seem very impressive because wait a second, don't we already know that it's <laughs> going to take a straight path? Yes, um, but when when Newton first formulated that the principle of inertia, he didn't put it in terms of of energy. Um, and so since he didn't put it in terms of energy, you, you still have to modify the, that Newtonian principle into those other areas that Dr. McLaughlin had mentioned. Another example would be uh, using the principle of least action, you can also predict, okay, well, if you throw, if you throw a rock through a gravitational field, right, so that just means right, if you throw a baseball um, from the pitcher's mound, and so once you give it its initial impetus, and it's flying through the air towards the catcher's mitt, what path is it, is it going to take? So there you have a, a beginning and an end point. Um, and if you assume what it will economize on energy through time, then mathematically the result you get, well, it, it uh, coasts gently in this, this per, uh, parabolic curve, a part of a parabola. So you, you use the principle and you, uh, uh, you can predict what the path will be, even if there are other ways you could predict the path. The, the advantage here is that you're, you're putting it in terms of, of the energy involved in the physical system. So the striking thing about the principle, am I getting this correct? The striking thing about the principle is that uh, there's nothing as such in what we know about um, the objects themselves, which are in fact all objects, which would require them to behave in accordance with this principle, and yet all physical objects of whatever size do behave in accordance with this principle. So, so were one trying to do something with it theologically, one would say that it, it, it is illustrating the point St. Thomas makes about the, um, the arrow, the directedness of the arrow. There's nothing actually in the, the, the nature of the arrow or its constituent parts which would cause it to travel in the way it does without being directed. So, so the, 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 the reason the principle is of theological interest is because it it, it's a universal principle according to which all bodies operate, and yet there's nothing in the constitution of bodies that we know of that would demand that they operate in that way. Or am I overstating it? I don't think you're overstating it. Um, but so it, this is, I think this is another way to either put that point or add to it is it gets back to some of those initial quotations from say, uh, Poincaré or others that I read, that uh, the, the finality or the, the just our human sense that this is something effective and efficient and even good, you can't read that from the mathematics, but at the same time, you can't deny that it's there, that it, there's, uh, if you, so if you think, if you were to think about nature, the natural order, entirely in terms of mathematics there's no reason in the mathematics why uh, uh, this body or that body takes this path or that path I mean they're both mathematically possible right it, it's not as if there's some uh, mathematical contradiction so then when you exit out of the mathematical world uh, of your of your equations and go see okay which well which path does nature choose it's always the, it's always this one it's always the one that optimizes action and that's usually a it, it's usually a a minimum value compared to other possibilities um, and yeah I think that's true I was trying to think as you're formulating that I don't and Dr McLaughlin can correct me if I'm or if I'm forgetting something but. I've never heard of anyone say, oh, and here's why 
physically or chemically or quantum mechanically, bodies have this property. It's just they do. They do behave this way. Um, and so since even within physics, they don't have an explanation for that, then uh, either, well, yeah, then it points to, well, maybe we need, a, we need other areas. Yes, whether that's more theological or whether that's uh, some metaphysical claim that, yeah, this isn't, it's not going to be sufficiently explained if we just focus within modern physics. I, I would like to press into the point that Dr. Femister brought out here. So, um, Dr. Brungard, if I'm hearing you correctly, uh, the first thing to note is just how far reaching the explanatory power of the principle of least action is. Uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Sabine Hassenfelder will call it, you know, possibly a world equation, possibly something like a, a theory at the very bottom of physics, so that it's, it's something that governs motion just so generally that's the first the second is that we're seeing something here that's truly an it's an optimization uh, economizing efficiency are the words that you use and then as dr firmest to point out well now we need an explanation and i want to uh, quote aquinas here on his fifth way he says quote we see that things which lack intelligence such as natural bodies act for an end and this is evident from their acting always or nearly always in the same way so as to obtain the best result. Hence, it is plain that not fortuitously, but designedly, they do they achieve their end. Now, whatever lacks intelligent cannot move towards an end unless it be directed by some being endowed with knowledge and intelligent as the arrow is shot to its mark by the archer. Therefore, some intelligent being exists by whom all natural things are directed to their end and this being we call God, end quote. So, uh, Dr. Brungart, whenever, whenever I hear uh, physicists speak about this topic, I'll hear either something like, oh, well, nature intends this, or nature wants this, um, which seems to me almost like we're personifying nature. Uh, you know, maybe 500 years ago, we would just say, you know, God has built the world in such a way, he's made natures in such a way, and today we just say, well, nature wants this, nature intends this. That's interesting to me. Or they'll say, well, this is just miraculous that this optimization is taking place. So I think that says something. And then just those terms, efficiency, optimization, seems to me that if you want to optimize something, you have to begin with the end and the work towards it. And that's the mark of intelligence. We start with the goal, we move towards the goal. And if we see unintelligent, inanimate things doing that, then we have to ask who has put the goal in these things. So Dr. Brungart, your, your thoughts there. Yeah, well, I might start with um, the point that was raised earlier about the arrow, that there's a, I think there's a way to, well, there's a couple ways to interpret Aquinas' example there in the fifth way that, and maybe one way is, well, the, the archer is uh, giving the arrow an end that it doesn't have on its own. Um which is true, but I don't, I don't think that's as helpful to interpret the analogy as kind of a pedagogical analogy in the fifth way that what we're trying to get at is, well, uh, things la that lack intelligence or, or things insofar as they lack intelligence, uh, they don't give themselves their ends, but they still have their ends. So the analogy is meant to have you start thinking about, uh, well, the it's, it's as if you're supposed to read the arrow as, well, now the arrow has arrow nature going to this target here. And so within that context, it's it's perfectly intrinsic to the arrow to be going to this target right here in this way. But the arrow can't do that. It can't give itself that end of itself. Um, yeah, so then the, as far as, see, yeah, so to, as an illustration uh, in the fifth way, um, uh, it's, it's helpful, and that's, it's helpful for, for really the second part of the fifth way, uh, that you need an intelligence to, uh, instill ends, instill natures into things. Um, 
but I think I think the the principle of least action is more helpful in the in the first stage, the first part of the fifth way, that uh, Aquinas's kind of implied example. Well, he does say natural. Sorry, he does say natural bodies. So, an implicit example there would. I mean, he would just bring up rocks. <laughs> it's like he would say, "Yeah, rocks consistently fall down, and uh, so they have a natural place uh, that they're attempting to reach. They're trying to reach. Um, and so, if you if you've encountered defenses of the fifth way today. Uh, Many of them, they kind of shy away from falling rocks as the go-to example. You like they like uh, people, and I well, I, and I do this in class too. So it's not it's, it's uh, you you point to living things. It's like well, here's a living thing, and you, then you talk about instinct, or you talk about um, uh, well, uh, a very something that an animal can do that that's very complex that. Uh, they never learned or observed other animals doing, say. Um, but I think a benefit of trying to understand the, the mathematics of the principle of least action in a broader context, so in, a, in the context of natural philosophy, is that you can, we can go back and start to see, okay, well, it, we, there are natural places for things, for inanimate things, it's it's just that the natural places that they're uh, directed towards via natural motion, uh, they're not the the sorts of natural places that Aristotle or Aquinas would have would have thought of, right? They're not trying to reach some geocentrically fixed, immobile middle of the entire universe, or fire's not trying to rise to the outer dome just underneath the sphere of the moon or something. <laughs> um, the destinations, as it were, where where a moving system would come to rest or equilibrium, um, they do look different now. Um, but nonetheless, I think they're still natural. Uh, we we didn't we don't uh, force the bodies to that the those locations or places, um, as Dr. Femister was pointing out. Uh, um, and, I, and I tried to indicate in my answer, uh, there's no current explanation for why inanimate bodies follow the principle of least action. They just do. Um, and so to my mind, that bespeaks something, the mathematics bespeaks something natural about the body. It's apart from our volition. It's, it's not by chance. It happens all the time. So those are kind of the marks of what's natural, uh, and so then you could you could just go back to the fifth way that well now we have even a we've kind of rec we've recovered Aquinas's example of well even rocks have their own limited teleology, um, even so nowadays well so massive objects uh, have their own limited kind of teleology in the. Uh, and that's kind of encoded and encapsulated in the principle of least action. Um, and so you, it might take a bit to draw out, okay, can you really see something good in that, right? Because uh, teleology is more than just mere consistent regularity. Do, you do have to bring in, well, there's something for the sake of which this is acting. But I think you could do that too. It just takes a bit more drawing out. I would point out, I think Dr. McLaughlin has done a great job um, in his work on gravity of pointing out those kinds of goods um, in teleology and specifically with motion of inanimate things. Dr. Brunkart, I really liked your discussion of the archer and your arrow. Um, the point being that things that lack an intelligence have an end, but they did not give themselves that end. It's natural to them, and then you've got to account for the origin of that nature, if I'm understanding you correctly. And from that and, and, and your comments just a minute ago, it seems to me that you could have a very nice explanation, um, and, and would you agree with this, 
of a lot of this discussion I see on the PLA about how, um, uh, say, a light ray or something like that knows where it's supposed to go to minimize its action. And this seems to give rise to quite a bit of the intensity of some of the back and forth among the physicists and others about this. It's crudely analogous to the question, how does the arrow know um, where to go? Once you understand the arrow, the way the Aquinas' arrow example, the way you gave it, the way you explained it, um, would you agree with that? And do you think you could elaborate on it? The principle of least action, and this is true, that uh, physicists will describe it as spooky, and yeah, how can how can uh, the light ray know ahead of time how to uh, 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 well in, in the case of gravity you know curve in just the right amount or um, how does yeah how does the ba- just to go back to the baseball how does the baseball know how to curve in the right amount um, um, to try to expand on that I mean I, one of the things I'm thinking about uh, these days I'm pr- on a slightly different but related project is uh, when Aquinas gives, when he, when he gives the fifth way, um, if you think of the fifth way more like a, a family of arguments, um, from what I can tell in his texts, there's more or less two versions. That there's the, the fifth way version, the, the first version what is what Austin just quoted, right, from the Summa Theologiae, and that's the, it, so it's much more, focused on uh, individual substances. So you, then you give the example of an arrow, say, okay. But in other places, and it does occur when he's talking about, say, providence, but he'll, when he's trying to argue that God has providence, he'll still he'll defend that using a kind of fifth way we see order in the world type of thinking. And so there he won't focus as much on individual objects and the, the finality or the the end goal of individual objects. He'll put uh, individual objects together. He'll, he'll think about uh, the whole. Um, and he's, I found out, I mean, he's drawing this from the church fathers. This goes, this goes way back. That and he'll, he'll still give pretty uh, uh, homely examples. It's like, well, if, if they're, if the if the principle of heat, if fire were allowed to range beyond its borders, well, then everything would be consumed, and so you have to have you have you have to have counterbalancing principles or natural natural causes. Uh, and so there's a it's not quite if right it's not quite modern fine tuning, um, but there is that kind of that sort of thinking that well the natural principles and causes they're not just uh, coordinated with respect to themselves. Well, I ha- the, this thing has this end, and that natural kind of thing has its own end. Um, there are also those ends are also coordinated with respect to each other, so that you get uh, a kind of whole, so that you get a, a cosmos. Um, and so that's I think that's also why the principle of least action is helpful here, because you have to. It's you're not just thinking about um, say a Newtonian setup where, okay, you have a rock floating through space and you can ignore everyone, everything else. And you're given an initial velocity and okay, calculate where it's going to go. Uh, you have to think about just to formulate the principle. Uh, so just go back to, if we can go back to the baseball again, like, yeah, you're one part of the equation is the baseball's kinetic energy. Okay. So that belongs to it. But the other part of the equation is the baseball's potential energy at this moment in time, and that depends upon its relationship to its surroundings. Um, so I think it seems to me that indirectly points out that the principle of least action really arises not from how this object on its own behaves, but how the object, uh, in, even in order to move, naturally speaking, it has to be coordinated with, uh, with its surroundings. And so uh, eventually with the, um, kind of mediated in a mediated way with the rest of the cosmos. 
Uh, Dr. Brungard, I want to respect your time. So uh, very briefly, I have just two short questions. The first is, how would you respond to the objection where someone listening to this says, well, you know, congratulations, you just discovered the laws of physics. You know, it's just laws. There's nothing, there's no, there's nothing behind it. We don't need to explain it. Um, so, so how would you respond to that, that explanation, the goal, um, directedness here in things of it? Well, it's just laws. That's, that's the first, if you can hold that in your mind, Dr. Yeah. Brungart, yeah. the second question uh, would be, and if there's anything good and true in this question, it's from reading Dr. McLaughlin, but it looks like to me, if potential energy is mass times gravity times height or distance for, for gravitational potential energy. Okay. Thank you. Um, it looks like to me baked into the question um, is an end is a goal. It's a destination, right? That those are, that's the G and H there. There's mm -hmm. a point, there's a distance from that point. So it just looks like to me that potential energy, we could call potency for natural motion. Um, in this case, would that, would that be correct? So those are my, my mm -hmm. two questions. I'm going to take the, the second one first that, um, yes, yeah, so when, when we say, when we describe gravitational potential energy, um, the MGH version is, is the simplified version because the G there, that only applies to earth. Um, which is fine. You could, you could modify the equation appropriately for other contexts. Um, potential energy points to an end, um, in the, the kind of frustrating way that potency points to an end that, yeah, it's potential for uh for some end um but of itself it's not so you need that right in order to fall you need the potential energy if you don't have potential energy that means you're at some you're well depending on usually that means you're on the ground and you can't fall any further mm -hmm. <laughs> um yeah so the expression uh mass times uh gravitational acceleration near the earth's surface times the height above the earth's surface um and maybe this is uh, Aristotelian natural philosophy reading too much into the tea leaves of the <laughs> mathematical formulation. But the, I mean, that H, the height above the surface, that can vary. Like if you could, you could calculate the potential energy with respect to halfway through. You get, so uh, that's, but that's similar to, well, this object has the, the potency uh, for local motion to a whole, a wide variety of endpoints. And so that's kind of indeterminate. That will depend upon, uh, you need that, right? That's a necessary condition, but for the sufficiency of the whole setup, you're going to need something more than just, okay, well, how far is it actually going to go? Um, but yeah, typically though, MGH is enough. And I think that's a, um, as you alluded to, uh, that's a, the mathematical from Dr. McLaughlin's work, that's the mathematical way to that we can capture a kind of potency for local motion. Um, and for the, the first question, um, yeah, it would depend on the interlocutor <laughs> uh, uh, because as, as Aristotle says, there's one way to go right and infinite ways to go wrong. So I'd have to figure out, okay, where in, in the, the infinite field of objections is this guy coming from? Presuming that I'm right. Um, <laughs> uh, no, but... Um, the a first step is going to be, okay, what do we mean by a law of nature? Um, and the Aristotelian Thomistic philosopher, Ed Fazer has great stuff on this. Uh, and I use it and I follow it in a lot of my work that if you start it, if you start the question there, it's like, well, okay, well, the guy will have to answer. It's like, well, I just think, um, a law of nature, it, it they could take a more human line. Like, okay. A law of nature is just, uh, a regularity. So you could push back on that and say, well, when, when scientists are actually formulating them, though, or using them or thinking about them, yeah, they, they often speak about them as, okay, this is just something empirical. This is an induction. It's a regularity. Um, but they marry it with, they'll, they'll join it with uh, talk about the, the dispositions of things or uh, what what something would tend to do, and then you'll get, you know, some laws that are more fundamental than other laws. If they take a, a Humean line, um, 
there are various responses to that. I was like, well, is, does a Humean account have the the best account of what a law of nature is? And so you could, yeah. So it, did, it would just depend on how he answered that question. It's like, well, what do you think a law of nature is? If he if he just defines a law of nature as what nature does, it's like, well, that doesn't. Well, then, uh, how, what do you say about laws that themselves are dependent upon other laws? Mm. Say, but yeah. Then you even there, you'd still have to answer the question. Um, the law describes it, but it doesn't really, is that really the explanation or are there other aspects of the, the physical situation, which the law partly describes that even scientists will point out, no, this is the, this is the causal factor at work, say. So, um, you alluded at the beginning to the fact that, um, the sort of teleological, natural theological possible implications of this have been mentioned by uh, you know, major figures uh, in the early modern uh, tradition and later, like Leibniz, um, over the centuries. Um, and but that also there's been a lot of pushback against that. So uh, I was wondering how far you feel the desire to avoid any such implications has molded uh, the development of, of physics over the last century and a half or so. Yeah, so just based off of my my reading or study in the subject, it does seem like part of the motivation is from more of a right a properly philosophical uh, stance. So when a positivist say encounters the principle of least action, it's like no, no, no. This is uh, this is just a kind of mathematical effect. And we don't have to look any further, right? But they're, yeah, they're they're bringing in their own kind of background assumptions. Uh, so, in the, so a kind of positivist. Well, we don't need um, a metaphysics of science. It's the the only metaphysics of science that we need is that there is no metaphysics of science. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's but it's hard for me to gauge that because it's I, I have the same suspicions sometimes with okay, why do uh, some cosmologists want to propose a multiverse theory. Uh, so Lee Smolin is, uh, he, he's sometimes cagey about it, but sometimes I do get the hint that, yeah, he, there are theistic implications, right? The existence of God that he wants to avoid. Or um, Leonard Susskind uh, sometimes expresses himself that way um, when it comes to, um, when it comes to string theory, say. Um yeah, I'd have to go f- figure this out. If I, I wonder if the balance is more on the side of scientists who see this, and yeah, they're they see it as further evidence of a kind of order. So there's, uh, but yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure on in the kind of sociology of science, like has some of this been ill received, or they don't uh, because of the the broader implications that they kind of see lurking in it. Um, but at the same time, uh, they still use it. <laughs> they tell me it's very effective. It's very, you, it makes, uh, in some cases, it makes the mathematics uh, ridiculously simple compared to alternate approaches. So it's, like it or not, they have to, they have to admit that. It's not going away. The principle of least action Maybe the world equation, as Professor Dr. Uh, Sabine Hassenfelder said, maybe a theory at the bottom of physics, maybe a knockdown, drag out evidence argument for a teleological world, maybe the contemporary point of departure for Aquinas' fifth proof for the existence of God. For more resources beyond this podcast on the principle of least action, see Dr. John Brungart's blog, his published works in this area, also Tom McLaughlin, uh, on his works on energy and uh, gravity and natural motion. Again, this is Think Catholic. My name is Austin Habish with Dr. Femister and special guests Dr. Tom McLaughlin and Dr. John Brungart. And thanks again for joining us. <laughs>